power, mm-hmm. uh, because that is how power operates in society. And that's why it no longer surprises me um, to find the pedophile rings and things at the highest levels right. of government. Yeah, oh, the Dennis Hastert, Speaker of the House, convicted child rapist? Nah, you know, I mean, w- no big deal. Let's just go on as if right. nothing really happened there. Um, so I, I was looking at all this information about these vile, psychopathic criminals that are always in charge of the system mm-hmm. and basically applied that consistently to go, oh, maybe it isn't a contingency. Maybe it isn't just about voting the right person into power. Maybe the the fact that uh, something like 9-11 can happen in the way that it happened and we can be lied to it by both the left and the right shows that this left-right game is nonsense. It doesn't make sense. So how do you put sense into this? Mm-hmm. And from that point, I think I was ready to hear um, the, the the logic about it that's articulated by, of course, great people uh, like Larkin Rose, who are great at articulating the the actual moral reasons why the idea of a ruling class is not just wrong, it's it's nonsensical. I mean, uh, it, there, there literally is no justification for having a ruling class, but people have been trained into imagining it. And and I, so I think it was the preparatory groundwork, the understanding of all of these facts that led me to the point where I was ready to hear the philosophy. Because if you're not ready to hear it, I think you just don't hear it. You don't care, right. fundamentally. Um, you can dismiss the idea, oh, yeah, but... You know, think of the real world, James. You know, you gotta, you gotta, you're not being practical. Um, well, no, I am. I'm being very practical. I understand that these horrible, psychopathic, vile people want to control you and your life, and they were the ones who created these positions of power. So, of course, they're going to fill them. And the the logical result of that is we should stop giving them the power. How do you stop giving them the power? Well, you stop participating in their phony rigged game. Right. You stop participating in their phony rigged elections right. in order to justify the, their rule over you. And uh, I think you know voluntarism falls out of that quite easily. I, I want to dig a little. This is something that I talk about. I'm realizing I talk about this privately with people a lot. This the the idea that we're we're getting into here with the cockistocracy uh, is that is that uh, the right cockistocracy cockistocracy. Yeah. I talk, I, I speak about this a lot in private, but I'm realizing that it's not something that on the show I've gotten really a chance to sort of go through. So I know that there's some people who are listening right now who heard what you just said, who are, are still probably a little bit incredulous. But I want to walk through this idea because it's a very important idea that it's one of those things, once you see it, you can't unsee it. So I, I, I want to talk about, because it's, it's, it's very important, very few people are able to come, I think, to this ideology in that way, but I think when you do, it's so powerful. This idea that the state, by definition, is a group with a monopoly on the use of violent force. They can basically have legitimate immoral behavior, robbing, st- uh, you know, stealing from people, killing people, whatever, and they, and they can make it legal. People have a difficult time making the jump from, they're like, okay, I accept that. And then you say, well, so we shouldn't be surprised that there are the worst type of people. We shouldn't be surprised that there's pedophiles in charge. And they're like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I, I want to just, if we could just dig a little further, your thoughts on, because I think, I think about this all the time and I talk to people about this all the time, the fact that people who even desire the highest level of power in the state are not like you and I in their minds. And could, could, you, could, could, could you give your thoughts on that? Or Because I know it's clearly something that you've thought about. To help people to understand that it's like, these are not the same people as you are. It's, and it's not even like reptilians. It's not even anything like that. It's just, these are not people who are thinking like you are. Could, could you expand on that and help people understand that a little bit? Yeah, I think it's a great disservice um, that we are we are almost in, incapable of comprehending the extent to which there are people um, clinically. I mean, this is mm-hmm. clinically demonstrable. People who whose brains function differently than you and I. This is psychopathy. Mm-hmm. It is a, a group of people who literally do not experience the human emotions that define yourself and myself and most of the people that we know, um, the ability to empathize and understand and 
and and care about other people on an emotional level is completely missing from a certain section of the population. And there are various estimates as to how great that is, 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. But at any rate, there is a percentage of the population that you can demonstrate their brains function differently than you or I in a way that is almost incomprehensible Mm -hmm. to people who have normal um, empathetic understanding of their fellow human beings. Um, Which, of course, the risk is making it into some sort of witch hunt where people just see psychopathy everywhere. Oh, this guy's a psychopath or just use that term, you know, willy nilly. But I think we do have to confront the very real reality of a certain group of people that do not experience any sort of empathy with other human beings. And as a result, can inflict the most unimaginable cruelty on other people Mm -hmm. and not all psychopaths, but certain psychopaths are motivated with a desire to rule over other people. So combine those character traits of a highly motivated person mm-hmm. with a desire to rule over people that does not experience a hint of regret or remorse on actions that are so unspeakably cruel that you and I wouldn't even contemplate them. And put that together and you have a perfect recipe for the most vile and ruthless people imaginable being attracted to these positions where they can live out their fantasies of ruling over other people. Um, It's almost like the system was designed for that express purpose, but at any rate, it's there. There are these troughs of power that Who's going to rise to those positions? Is right. it the people who play nice and, and think of other people and put other people's interests ahead of their own and, and work together with others and, and care? Or is it the people who will slit their own grandmother's throat for the chance of you know succeeding, metaphorically or literally? And, and obviously it's the latter. And that's why I mean, psychopaths are, are people who function, uh, high-functioning psychopaths with certain character traits are the people who rise to the top of corporate pyramids. They're the people who rise to the top of governmental pyramids because they are the ones who will do absolutely anything to achieve the power that they lust after. And I think that it should be no surprise that this is not something that people have been talking about and certainly that you're not going to hear uh, establishment individuals talking about because presumably there's some uh, you know that it's uh, the, the the percentage is much certainly going to be much higher as you say like just the simple market forces of th- holding this position is so would be so valuable and so important to this particular individual it's almost it's almost like look who the the people who truly love playing hockey, for instance, you know, are going to be the ones who spend the most time on the ice. Some percentage of them are going to be the ones who wind up being the best at it. Some are naturally going to be talented as well. And so you're going to see those people overrepresented on a professional hockey team. Like it's just a simple market. So go ahead. Well, it's even worse, really, because, again, psychopathy only afflicts a small percentage of the population. And again, there are various uh, estimates as to what percentage. But the worst part is that psychopaths can create systems, create hierarchies and create incentive structures that incentivize people to act like psychopaths. Mm. And when people are put into those situations, they can become like psychopaths, even if they are not technically, clinically, in terms of their brain chemistry, mm. actually psychopathic. Uh, that, it, again, there are different ways that these terms are used, but that's one idea of sociopathy. Sociopaths are people who have been crafted and into a system where they become almost like psychopaths. Mm. And the prime examples of that that have been studied in recent years come from places like Abu Ghraib, mm. where the, uh, the 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 sort of average, you know, farm farm bo- farm boys and girls from Midwest uh, you know, America go uh, halfway around the world and suddenly are doing these incredibly, insanely torturous, horrible, cruel things to other people that if they had just been living their lives in the Midwest, probably they wouldn't have done. They wouldn't have acted those things out. Um, they're placed into the situation where it brings them out. This isn't to absolve people of personal responsibility for their actions, obviously, but it does point to one of the sickest parts of the sick system is that when you have you know, that those certain very extremely ruthless psychopaths in certain positions of power, they can create 
a, a structure around them that actually incentivizes the creation of of people like them and uh, moves those people up the ladder. So although most of the population is not psychopathic, there is an, there's a slightly larger percentage who can be motivi motivated or incentivized to become sociopathic and will discard their, uh, their morals and their upbringing as necessary to get ahead in the system. So it kind of creates this uh, perpetuation of itself. And I think we see that. I think that's part of what we see with the deterioration overall in, uh, I, I mean, just the, the idea of the system creating um, changes in the people should sure. be quite obvious to people who think if you went back even 20 years ago right. and talked to the average American and talked about things like, you know, a Department of Homeland Security and TSA right. and all of these incredible things, they would have said that's stupid, you know, that's that's sci science fiction, that kind of stuff happens in Soviet, in Soviet Russia, that doesn't happen here. And now it is everyday reality, and you know people people join, sign up. Hey, I want to be a TSA agent. I want to be in the work for the DHS. So oh, it's cool. You know, twenty four torture. You know, all this stuff. Um, people can be completely switched over if they are placed into a system, and that's I think one of the one of the things that these high functioning psychopaths do is create systems that basically incentivize the creation of more people like them. Yeah, and there's a there's a growing body of scientific literature that is I examining this question of how how power the the ability to have power or wield power over other people's actually changes your brain chemistry and your brain functioning, mm -hmm. and there is growing amount of scientific evidence that there really is something to that, and I think that should be obvious again in the ways that this is manifested in our society currently, and people who get that taste of power. I mean, before, again, these types of things would have been unthinkable, but once people see it, oh, okay, I can have this power over other people, they start wielding it. I mean, this goes back to the Stanford prison experiments course, and all of course, that, yeah, yeah. Um, that when you put people in those positions of power, they start enacting it and uh, bringing these things into reality. So this is this provides also some very, I mean, we're talking about some dark stuff here, but it also provides some hope for those of us who have decided that, look, we'd like to see some other systems because one of the things that always comes up when you speak with status is this idea that and this is this argue, this discussion we're having right now has has opened my mind on this to, to use this as an argument is this idea that oh if the government was gone right now you know you can't trust people the way that they act it's going to be this that and the other but they're not considering that it may be that people are behaving that way because of the system itself right so you talked about uh, withdrawing consent. What are, when you look at the things that the average everyday person can do, I know there's a lot of people who watch the show who are anarchists, voluntarists. They want it, you know, they're, they're looking out and they're like, what can I do as an individual? What can I do? What are the things that you feel are the powerful things that, that any individual can just do for themselves as actions to really start embodying this? Well, I think the ground base level of this is cognitive independence, which is easier said than done. But that goes, I think, to the, the point that we're, we've been making here is that we are indoctrinated in the society that we grow in up in to some extent or other. And it's impossible to escape that. But there are different ways to imagine uh, comporting yourself in the world than what we have been taught either explicitly or implicitly through what we see. And I always go back to that level of of understanding about the education indoctrination system as being the root of so much of what plays out politically. Um, the, the fact that people can't imagine the world being anywhere any other ways because of course you grew up in certain systems of control. And I think an excellent, absolutely must see 100%, if I could only recommend one documentary to people, they might be surprised to see that I recommend uh, a documentary called Children Full of Life. It's up on YouTube. Huh. Go watch it. It's I'm going to put a link to that. Minutes. Yeah, very interesting. It, it, it is absolutely essential viewing because it, I think, really demonstrates, it shows you what a different idea of education could be that would actually potentially lead to people who would be able to imagine the world being in a different way, hmm. that things could be more about, well, why do we need the leader authority to tell us? I mean, it's, it's a really wonderful documentary. And I think uh, it's interesting because it's not really to do with the politics side of it, hmm. which is what polarizes people and people get into their little camps. This is about 
children and the way they come to understand and process the world and, and work with each other uh, in that world. So at any rate, that's something that I would say as sort of the base level of this. And that's why I think this is the idea of moving from a statist world to a post-statist world is obviously an intergenerational effort that will take. I mean, there there is no magical switch that can be flipped to suddenly go, you know, OK, now there's no government. Um, and even if there was, even if I had my finger on that switch, I wouldn't flip it right. overnight. I wouldn't just, OK, you know, done. Now all, all governments are gone because at the very best, you know, the system would return completely overnight. Right. I mean, it has to be more fundamental and people have to have a certain uh, consciousness level before we can transition. And I think the transition is really the, the important part of this. But um, having said that, what are people, what are things that people can do right now? And of course, it's the things that you can actually do right now. What on earth are you and I going to do about the development of the Hwasong 14 by right. North Korea and this, you know, these types of situations? Uh, there's, I, you can write your congressman to what? I mean, it's, it's nonsense. The things that we can affect are the things that we do, the things that we participate in, the places that we spend our money, the people that we spend our time with. This is our way of living and interacting and affecting the world. And it's, uh, that's why absolutely every fundamental solution comes down to, to that, that level of analysis, which is why in the broad sense, agorism and all of the things that fall under that, I think is the real way forward in this. It's the, not just, I mean, it's, it's not about opposing the system and it's not just about extracting yourself from that system. It's about building the alternative yes, system yes, yes. that is the I mean if we're going to do something we have to build the alternative and that's why agorism in all of its broad um, sense is is ultimately what this is about now different people have different interests and different things which is why they will be gravitate towards certain parts of this or others the technologically inclined might be more interested in Bitcoin evangelism or finding different ways outside of the monetary paradigm or people who are um, are, are more hands-on might want to do guerrilla gardening, you know, grow a garden in your neighborhood and grow a fruit tree and, you know, change people's perception of what nature is and how they relate to it. Uh, again, these things work on an extremely um, deep level, consciously and subconsciously, to transform our understanding of the world and the way it is. And I think all of those things that people can do to get their hands dirty, literally or metaphorically, are all to the good insofar as they make us once again into actors mm. in this world rather than spectators. Because the ultimate effect of just studying the geopolitical machinations is to put us into that spectator role. Yes. Okay, so this is what North Korea is doing. This is what yes. China is doing. This is what Japan is doing. This is what Uncle Sam's doing. You know, what do I do about that? I, I guess I can, you know, complain about it on Twitter or something. But no, I mean, the things that you actually do in your real life that actually have physical effects on the world make us understand once again, no, the important point is not to be the spectator, it is to be the actor. And that's, again, it's a consciousness thing. And that's why I think at the end of the day, this is about consciousness. This is about our understanding. And uh, here's an interesting point, perhaps, mm -hmm. to maybe leave this conversation on, nice. is the idea of the first follower. Um, there's a great video up on YouTube and I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head, perhaps first follower, just type that into YouTube. And you'll see a video of uh, a, a music festival. Oh, where there's yes, the Sasquatch festival, the guy dancing. Oh, what a powerful, guy, what a powerful. crazy thing. guy gets No, please, please tell, please explain dance. this. No, please explain this to the people what happens. So there's a music festival and this guy gets up and he's doing this crazy dance and everyone's just kind of tittering at him. Oh, you know, he looks kind of strange. And it's just like a joke. This guy's just crazy. But then someone else gets up and starts dancing with the guy. And suddenly, I mean, it's again, it's kind of fun. It's funny. Oh, you know. And so a few more people join in and then a few more. And then suddenly, literally everyone at this festival is up and dancing and doing this crazy thing. And it's the, the point of this is that it's the, the social proof of seeing someone else who uh, who does this as well. Oh, it's not okay, so it's not crazy. I mean, I can do it. I mean, it's fun. Let's just join in. And that's, that's an important point of all of this, is that 
again, we we tend, I mean, the, the ultimate part of so much of the propaganda indoctrination we get is that you are alone, you are isolated, you're an individual, you're helpless. All you can do is to pull a lever every four years. And that is your that is your participation in this system. And uh, don't think about doing anything more. We need people to talk about articulate these ideas and these concepts so that other people can look and say, oh, well, other people see this as well. Other people think this. Other people are doing something about this. I can do it too. And that's why, I mean, I don't want to put ourselves on a pedestal, but conversations like this one and millions of others that are happening every day and increasingly in the online sphere are important in if for nothing else than to get people to understand that they are not alone in what they're thinking and doing. And that's that's an exceptionally important part of all of this, to understand we are active, we're not spectators, we are choosing our the life that we want to live and the, the people that we want to live with and the, the things that we spend our time and money on. And those are our ways of affecting reality. We can reshape this planet, we can reshape the world. It does not have to be the way it is right now. And uh, the, I think that's the most important message that we can put out there for now. Um, as people start to flex their muscles, it's like any other muscle, you train it, it will get bigger over time. And that's that's the point. James Corbett, powerful, a powerful message. Uh, I wanna thank you for the work that you've done. We're talking about building the Agora. And if there's anybody who has uh, contributed to the knowledge base, I think of the people who, as new people are gonna come into this and you've already laid so much of a groundwork for, for them to be educated in what's going on, what's happened in the past and what's coming in the future. I want, I want to thank you for that. I mean, it's, I, you know, there's not enough praise, I think, that people could heap on the work that you're doing and thank you for continuing to do it. Um, thank you for being on the show and we'll, you know, we'll have you again soon, I hope. 